Let's get connected to the vine this morning. I ask you to bow your heads. Heavenly the Father, we thank you that uh, you want to be our sovereign God this morning. As we unpack that this morning, we just ask uh, that uh, we'll be given some wisdom and some uh, learning, Lord, that we can apply to our own lives. And that this morning, my words will be your words in your name. Amen. All right, I'll try and manage it from here, Chief. And I need these things. The king. I've always thought of myself as a bit of a king. Independent and in charge. At least of my own castle. Maybe not. Or at uh, least my man cave. My own subjects, my own time. Sounds like a bit of a fairy tale, doesn't it? But I do like the idea of um, sovereigns and kings and queens. There's lots of movies, of course, about this stuff as a history teacher. Um, Movies about medieval times, about how becoming a knight has more to do with your character than your birthright. Um, Movies about kings and queens and how despite the birthright to be royalty, some worked very hard at it and did much for their subjects. The idea, of, the idea of monarchy, of being in charge of my own destiny, appeals to me, and I'm sure it appeals to you, doesn't it? We all want to be in charge, don't we? We don't like being told what to do. We'd all rather do what we think is best. Matter of fact, I've always thought it would be cool to own my own country like this guy. Maybe you haven't heard of this guy. His Royal Highness Prince Leonard, uh, self-proclaimed ruler of the Hutt River Province. Anyone heard of the Hutt River Province? Yes, self-proclaimed ruler in WA. Only in WA. Um, He seceded from Australia back in 1970. Don't ask me how he managed to do that, but he set up his own little sovereign country and said, this is my land. Nobody else is going to tell me what to do, except that uh, currently the ATO is after him for unpaid taxes. So good luck, Prince Leonard. It's not quite working for you. So monarchy... Monarchy sounds good, but sovereign sounds better, doesn't it? So if I was going to be sovereign, what does it mean to be sovereign? Well, there were these little beauties from uh, some time back. Back in 1489, you could get a gold sovereign. You're going, oh, cool, sovereignty is all about money. Hmm? Maybe not. But if we look at the headlines, there's lots of headlines that tell us about what sovereignty is. China's sovereign fund, back steel for China. We get sovereign wealth funds, which really means it's state-owned. Okay, so a country does their own investment uh, funds. Um, out of curiosity and interest, Norway has the largest state uh, wealth fund and it's worth $1 trillion. We're moving to Norway next week. Um, we can talk about sovereign debt. Ooh, that doesn't look good. If you're in one of those countries, mm, especially when you look at the debt to GDP, how much they're up to their eyeballs. You know, and we talk about the fact that, you know, Greece and Italy and some of those countries look like they are potentially going to fall over. We can talk about sovereign borders. We've had that own, our own policy in place for a while. Let's have a look at what the Bible says 
because the idea of sovereignty comes from the Bible. So let's go and have a, have a look. The Bible mentions the word sovereign 303 times in the Old Testament of the New International Version. But it's always used in association with the word Lord and is the equivalent of the King's James, King's James Version's Lord God. So it's very clear that uh, God is sovereign. It actually comes from a Latin word super, which means above, and a French word reign, to rule or govern. Therefore, when we use the word in this context, God reigns from above. I like that, don't you? So to say God is sovereign is simply to declare that God is God. Elevated above all in the universe, answerable to no one else, and possessing infinite power. God has the infinite right, the infinite rule, and infinite reign. He is the Most High. And there are plenty of texts to support that. The Lord has established his throne in heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Jesus Christ is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honour and eternal dominion. Amen. In Samuel... How great you are, O sovereign Lord. There is no one like you and there is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. And in Daniel, all the people of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? This kind of like brings in a new idea. We've been saying how God is wonderful and high and, you know, mighty and he's way up there. But now it's kind of like, well, no one can question what God does. And as humans, we find that difficult to deal with, don't we? Because sometimes we look around us and we go, what's going on? I want to look at two examples from the Bible this morning. Um, One who didn't understand God's sovereignty and one who did. So we're going to have a look at um, Moses and Pharaoh to start with. Pharaoh. In Exodus, Moses has been chosen by God to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. God has given him special powers and instructions on what to do. Mind you, Moses wants to argue about that, doesn't he? He's going, no, no, not me, not me. Pick someone else. I'm not your man. The Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who makes a man not able to speak or hear? Who makes one blind or able to see? Is it not I, the Lord? So go now and I'll be with your mouth and I will teach you what to say. Moses has a mind blank moment and goes, I can't do it, I can't do it. And God is reassuring him that he is sovereign and to buckle up. Okay, I will give you what you need. So Moses and Aaron go to see Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Is that so, retorted Pharaoh? And who is the Lord? Why should I listen to him listen to him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. I don't know, you know. I would have thought that uh, Pharaoh would have had a fair idea about who God was. And for him to pull this one out is like, well... Really? And uh, as we see, following on, um, 
this was going to cost um, Pharaoh not only uh, his people, his family, uh, but even his life. So there were the plagues that rolled through. It almost look, looks like cane toads. And we get to the big, the big showdown. But you would have thought anywhere along this point, Pharaoh could have said, hmm, this is not working out real well for me, is it? At any point, he could have looked at the evidence to go, hmm, who's got more power here, me or this God? But as we know, Pharaoh hardened his heart, didn't he? Pharaoh hardened his heart and wasn't interested in any kind of back down, any kind of compromise, and we see how this ends up. And good old Charlton Heston here. Okay, we end up with the crossing of the Red Sea, which does not end well. Let's have a look at Job. Remember the story? Satan is trying to undo God as sovereign and says that Job only follows God because God blessed Job and suggests that if all that was taken away, Job might have a different story to tell. And so it begins that uh, Satan starts taking things away. There we go. But what is Job's response at this point in time? The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Man, if that happened to me, I'd struggle, wouldn't you? But such was Job's faith and such was Job's conviction and such was Job's belief in a sovereign God that he goes, Lord gives it, Lord takes it away. Job's wife. Then his wife says to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he says to her, you speak as one of the foolish women would speak. Shall we receive good from God and shall we not receive evil? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Job held on, at least for a while. Later on, Job starts to question, Job starts to doubt, and his three friends come to badger him and say, look, you've obviously done something wrong, otherwise why would God be doing this to you? They missed the point entirely. Okay, it wasn't God doing this to him. But Job starts to doubt. Elihu, who's got this brief cameo, and we don't know much about Elihu, where he came from or how much he knew Job, but he comes along and says, Look, Job, behold, God is great, and we know him not. The number of his years is unsearchable. Listen, Job, you just need to realise... It's not about you. It's about someone much higher and greater and you just need to stick with the program. Job confesses that uh, he uh, has been thinking down the wrong path. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Okay, Job gets to the realisation, although he's had some doubts because of what his friends have been telling him, that he really goes, yeah, no, you're right. You're right, Elihu. It's, yeah, I can see what's going on here and I know that God can do all things and that uh, no, pur- no purpose of God's can be thwarted. Winston Churchill at the, beginning of wanted, at the beginning of World War II, he wanted to uh, 
wanted to know who was in charge. Prime Minister Baldwin at the time, and unfortunately history reflects badly on this guy, he was probably an optimist, hoping for a, pro a political solution, but that didn't eventuate because Hitler was obviously gearing up for war. And so Churchill would go around Parliament reciting a line from Edward Millikan's poem, Who's in charge of the clattering train? And uh, you can just imagine Winston Churchill in a nice sarcastic tone, wandering around Parliament, blurting that one out. Who is in charge? Seems to change on a daily basis, doesn't it? We see this even in our own political system. Who's in charge? I like the picture at the bottom, don't you? It's a pity they didn't spend more time doing that. Yeah? I don't know what each of them are praying for. But uh, we wish that they did that more often. It's evident from the news every night that this question needs answering. It's evident from our human history that humans have not appreciated the sovereignty of God and have deliberately sought to exclude God and assume the mantle of control. Human sovereignty. Strangely, this ideology has not reaped the benefits humans have sought. Is human sovereignty working for, them, for us? No. Ellen White mentions this. Men are so intent upon excluding God from the sovereignty of the universe that they degrade man and defraud him of his dignity, of his origin. But this started way back, didn't it? Way back. Nimrod. Nimrod effectively told God, we don't need you coming down here. We're coming up to you. We've got a better plan. Okay? We don't need you coming down here to talk to us anymore. We've got a much better idea. So, sovereign. Sovereignty. How should I respond to the sovereignty of God this morning. We'll, we'll be in by quarter past, okay? How do we respond to the sovereignty of God this morning? If I truly believe that he is the highest authority in the universe, that he has no equal, his power knows no end, he is the creator and the saviour, he is everywhere and knows everything, then how should I respond this morning? Firstly, because God is sovereign, I will respect and reverence him. How many times have you heard the, uh, the story? Well, if Queen Elizabeth was uh, uh, grace for, uh, gracing our presence next week here at this church, would that change anything? Some people it might, some people it wouldn't. How would that change what we did, how we acted, how we dressed, would it impact on us at all? So if we're prepared to make some changes for an earthly monarch, how much more should we be willing to change for a, uh, an eternal monarch? Oops. Yes, we're on the right slide. Um, in Proverbs 9.10, it says, Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
This is not a debilitating fear. This is the kind of acknowledgement that God is all-powerful and that we need to respond to God in a very humble manner. We need to acknowledge that God is our sovereign. And so that would change probably some of the ways we do things. We need to come to God with reverence and respect. We need to respond to our sovereign God through obedience. Why didn't Pharaoh obey? And who is the Lord? Why should I listen to him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord. I didn't know. He didn't know the sovereign God. He was disobedient. But if we know the sovereign God, then we should obey his direction in our lives. And how do we know what he wants us to do? You only get that by spending time on your knees and reading what God has to say. Abraham, he's pleading to God. In Genesis 18, we find the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and how God wants to destroy it. He's questioning God here and going, Look, God, if there's 50, you know, souls left in these towns, can you save it? If there's 40, if there's 30, if there's 10. But eventually, Abraham has to come to the realisation that God actually knows what he's doing. And he says, look, there is no one left except this family and they're going to be leaving And hence, Sodom and Gomorrah take their place in history. But in doing so, as Lot and his family leave, Lot's wife finds out the consequences of disobeying God, doesn't she? A pillar of salt. She didn't believe that God was sovereign and so chose a path that led to her destruction. The third point this morning, we need to respond to God through worshipping him. And we've already done that this morning, haven't we? But we need to worship him through good and bad times. Worship the Lord and the splendour of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Praise the God who gives and takes away. And that's a difficult thing to do sometimes. And I haven't had to deal with some of the struggles that I know others deal with here and even in this church. And, um, you know, I haven't really, and and I'm saying this going, I hope that doesn't mean I'm going to have to, but I really haven't had to go through that. But I know there are plenty of people here who have. And it would be incredibly hard to praise God when you're going through tough stuff. David is a bit of a champion for praising. He praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting yours. Lord is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head above all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Some days we feel like that, don't we? And then there are other days when it's a struggle. But we need to worship. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and, can't read it from up the back, and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise in Revelation. We know that the earth is on a journey and that, that it has an end. 
This journey has been described to us by our sovereign God. We know these things to be certain because of what we see in the world around us and by the course of human history. You can choose to believe in an alternate ending created by human minds, but we can see history is providing us with the folly of that dream. So although sometimes the world seems dark and you may like Job, have to struggle in your life, uh, sorry, struggle in your faith of a sovereign God, you can today choose to believe that our God, my God, is sovereign, high above all else, all-knowing, all-forgiving, all-loving, and not wishing that any should perish. Give us faith, give us strength, give us hope as we hold on to God's sovereignty. Ellen White clearly says to us, that we are formed from the dust and Adam was the son of God. What does that mean? We're related to a sovereign already. We're already princes. We're already princesses. We are already connected to royalty. So one day I hope to be wearing a crown. I hope to be royalty. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day and not only to me but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And I hope that we're all in that category this morning that we are longing for his appearing, believing God's sovereignty today. Heavenly Father, We are so grateful that you are a sovereign God and that this morning we can come humbly before your throne asking for forgiveness of the things that we've done wrong, seeking your wisdom and counsel in our lives that you will continue to lead us on the paths that are everlasting. Lord, uh, we're just so glad that you want to be our sovereign this morning and we humbly submit ourselves to you in your name. Amen.